Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for a live talk with STEM ambassadors Tom and Andrew from IQVIA, which collaborates with customers and partners to help people live longer, healthier lives. It's great to see you joining us this afternoon and to celebrate British Science Week, we're going to delve, delve into the fascinating world of science discovery. Tom will explain about medicines, how they are developed and where they come from, whilst Andrew will talk about how life has changed in the workplace over the years and explain about hybrid working, which means that people can do their job from home or at the workplace. Um, today's talk will be fun and interactive. We're using Slido um, so we can record some of your responses to questions that will be asked. The code for that is in the chat, so please take a look and please feel free to ask any questions and our presenters will aim to answer them at the end of their talk. So let's get started. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon. Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Cooper and I'm project manager for IQV and I work on their many clinical studies. And today I'm going to talk to you about a medicine discovery story. So first off, I'm going to just talk to you about what I'm going to go through in this presentation. So I'll talk about a quick history of medical discovery, the here and now, and the future of medicine. And just a quick reminder for all teachers and parents that to, to access the interactive elements, please go to slido.com and use the code IQVIA STEM UK, all one word. I'll just leave that up there for a couple of seconds so you can just type all of it. Okay, now on to what a medicine, what is a medicine? So some common examples would be cowpole, ibuprofen, paracetamol or hay fever tablets. But the thing is, we don't just find these medicines in their ready to go form. Uh, form. They're not just in Amazon packages in the dirt. We just don't find them ready made. You have to find the source. And now I have a question for you. Where do you think we find new medicines? So this is going to be a word cloud and all I want is for you to politely give your suggestions to your teachers or parents, and we'll just see what comes up on the screen and we can talk about that. Okay, feel free to submit your answers. Looks like there's a little bit of a delay, but we'll just keep it up there for going for a little bit longer. Yep, pharmacy again. It's where your mum and dad go or any adult would go to pick up their medicines when they're feeling ill. Very good answer. But that's where we get uh, the finished product. Volcanoes, that's interesting. We, that, there have been uh, found some, in, uh, some new medicines near volcanoes, not specifically in the lava themselves, but around the area. Hospitals, they, ha they again have the finished product. So similar to pharmacy, but I like the idea and the links there. So we have plants as well. Yes, plants is a very big one. Animals as well. We find a lot around the uh, around the globe. Nature. Yes, these are all incredible answers, and you are all thinking along the right lines. All right. Yes, lovely everyone. Okay, now I'm going to stop the uh, word cloud here and talk about one of the weirder places we found it, and someone's actually touched upon this now as well with the fungi answer. So we'll go to the, my next slide and I'll just stop this word cloud. Thank you everyone. Now, one of the weirder places we found a new medicine is actually on some dirty dishes. So a very famous scientist called da uh, Dr. Alexander Fleming, he went away to see his family for Christmas and on the holiday on, when he came back, he noticed that on some dirty dishes there was mold. I know it's a little gross, but bear with me. So on this mold, he realized that it was keeping away all the other mold from growing. and He'd never seen this before. He was uh, surprised, a bit confused, and he didn't really know what was happening. So he went about trying to uh, study this uh, mold and find out what was happening and if it could be used for any benefit for everyone else. And so he did what he decided to did and did that. So now we go into the here and now of medicine to discuss this further. So, like I said, penicillin discovered on some dirty dishes. It turns out this was incredible. It cured tons of infections, saved countless lives, and it was used globally almost immediately as soon as it was found safe for, patient, for people to use. 
The issue is that unfortunately, no good thing lasts forever. And the germs are learning, slowly, but learning. And so the reason for this was because when you go to your doctors, in either the hospital, your GP, or the pharmacy to get whatever medicine you need, if they're antibiotics that you're given, they'll tell you to take one or two a day for maybe a week, maybe for 14 days. And the issue with this is you need to take the full course because if you don't, the germs that have hidden in your body will stay hidden and they'll adapt. And they do this because normally, when people feel better on day five or six of a seven day course, they'll stop taking it. And so the germs have gotten that chance to hide and learn. And because they've adapted, we need to adapt too. And to do that, we need to find new medicines that are as good or better than penicillin. And so the antibiotic race began. And now I'm going to put it to you guys again. I want to find out how you think we're going to solve and stop germs becoming smarter. Now, this is a poll, so you're going to submit one, one of the to one of the answers above. The first one is A, make the germs fight each other. B, make new medicines to fight the germs. C, politely ask the germs to stop making us ill. Or D, none of the above. Again, please just uh, chat to your teacher or parents or guardians to suggest the answer you want to put, and we'll just talk about it. A solid start there, making the germs fight, uh, making new medicines. Are there any, is it just a, I believe everyone thinks that at the moment. We'll just see if there's a bit of discourse there. Oh, some people want to make the Germans fight each other. That would be lovely. Yes. Always a good start. It would be fun if we could get them into a, like an, a little arena just to uh, dis discuss what they're doing. Or even just being able to talk to them would be fun as well. It'd be easy, be simple. All right, these are some really good answers. And I think we have a clear winner at the moment with Make New Medicines to Fight the Germs. Now, I'm going to stop, uh, I'm going to stop the poll here just to discuss the answer. So the majority of people are right. We have to make new medicines to fight the germs while well paying attention to the presentation. And that, to discuss this further, we're just going to go into the antibiotic race. And what I mean by this is that as soon as we realized these germs were getting smarter and adapting to what our treatments were, we realized we had to go back to the basics initially. We had to keep finding new plants and new animals that had adapted specific uh, reasons to fight the different germs and diseases more effectively. So again, you do so, we do send people out into the wilderness, into jungles, into caves, not into volcanoes, but near them. We want them to come back safely. Uh, and that does help. We find out the, we find out a lot of things in nature. The second thing is a lot of organizations and researchers and scientists decided that it would actually make sense if we work together more and we research things together across the country. And this improved the level of teamwork, our level of understanding, and helped us solve harder questions because we could put more great thinkers together. And this leads into my next point, which is studying the germs and diseases more closely. This is really key because for a long time, we didn't really know how things were making us ill and how they interacted in the body. And so we had to actually sit down and do the hard work and study them. And then lastly, we had to talk about, we had to think about creating a better education for all the children in the next generation. For example, all of you. And the reason we want to do this is because you, we ultimately want all of you to become smarter and more intelligent than, the pre, than ourselves. Like you will, through better education, become smarter than your parents. They may not agree, but you will. And we truly want you all to achieve your scientific potential if that's what you want to pursue. And one of the ways we're doing that is through STEM, like and these events similar to what we've done this week in British Science Week. All of this helps build the foundation to beat germs and solve problems we don't we have today. And that leads me into my next topic: what does the future hold? And so I want to conclude by saying the future is very exciting. The first one, and some of you may have heard this and some of you may not, is artificial intelligence. And what I mean by this is that for a long time now, we've been making machines that just help us solve everyday issues. And now it's gotten to the point where we can make these machines think and act like we do. 
we can ask them questions that we wouldn't be able to ask them normally. And they can provide answers that we wouldn't have thought about because they don't have the same thought processes as us. They're just similar. And so they can create stories, they can solve math problems, they can write essays. And we're using this globally to help solve today's problems and tomorrow's and the futures. Um, an example of this would be maybe ChatGPT, if you've heard of that. The next thing is you, uh, something I've touched on a little previously. So global collaborations, and that grew from the scientists working across the country to realizing that they should be working across Europe, across the USA, North America, all the different continents in the globe to really build upon the research we are uh, creating and finding things out across nations. And this global collaboration between different companies like IQVIA, um, the NHS, uh, across Europe with France and Germany, all of these collaborations really help build a solid foundation for the future and for the issues we want to solve. And lastly, again, the biggest thing we can do is to create brighter and brighter scientists in the next generation. We truly want all of you to achieve your potential in your scientific avenues. We want you to exceed what we could, what we did. We want you to become the next generation of geniuses and solve all these problems because Whilst we can solve some, ultimately we will rely on all of you. And I fully believe all of you can achieve your potential. Now, this is the end of my presentation and I will be leaving it to my colleague, Andrew. And I hope you have a, rest, a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, that's a great presentation. And uh, just to let everyone know, Tom is, uh, continuing to be involved because he's managing my slides for me so every now and again you'll hear me hear me say next slide and tom will will uh, take it to the to the next slide during my presentation so my name's andrew um i've worked in clinical research which is the development of new medicines uh for about 36 years now uh, so that's a long time and during that time you know i've seen a lot of change in the workplace the way we work and really that's down to technology so the technology that's been developed by scientists has uh, not only moved our knowledge forward but it's also um, uh, changed the way we work and and uh, uh, for the for the better uh, and i'm sure if i worked for another 36 years uh, i would see even more change uh, and it's important to remember that you know the jobs that uh, people did in the past the jobs that people do today are different and you know by the time you enter the workplace uh, there will definitely be jobs available and, and jobs that people will be doing that that don't exist today just because of the, the the speed at which technology is changing so i'd like to talk to you today about some of those changes that have that have happened so if we could go to the next slide so on this slide uh, is just the three things we're going to talk about today. So um, you may not have thought about why we work where we work, um, but I'll talk to you a little bit about that and then to really look at the impact of technology uh, on, on those various places of work. Uh, for my career, I've always worked in an office, uh, whether it be in, in, in a, a shared office or in a home office. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how uh, the, uh, that place of work has changed over over time. And I'm going to start off on the next slide um, by um, looking at the first place of work, which you're most familiar with, which is which is schools. Um, for you, they're places of study, um, but for your teachers and other school staff, this is their, their place of work. Uh, and I don't know whether you've ever thought about why schools are located where they are located. Um, you know, they need to be easy to get to, uh, whether you're walking to school or taking public transport or going by car. Um, so they're close to the community uh, where you as students are, are coming from and also uh, and also your teachers. And they're a place to bring together teachers and students um, so that uh, those learning activities can happen uh, and they need to have the space available for the buildings themselves and also the outdoor areas that you're using uh, maybe it's sports activities or at break time but technology has impacted the school and uh, 
some of you may very well be at home studying at this at this moment as you're listening to this presentation uh, and the ability to study away from a school uh, has been made possible due to uh, advances in technology and particularly around communications. Um, so let's look at how technology has impacted uh, schools and the way that you study if we go to the next slide. So obviously we're giving you this pre presentation today uh, in a virtual manner. We, we're using MS Teams, uh, which I've mentioned on the slide here, and that's just one of many apps and, and uh, uh, um, uh, systems available uh, on the internet to allow uh, virtual working as it's called. Uh, you've already used the Slido system, which is mentioned here, uh, and we'll be using it at, again at the end of, of my presentation. Um, you know, when I went to school and uh, when I was your age, it was around um, 1975. I don't really like to think about that, but uh, it was it was around the mid 70s. Uh, and when I was at school, you know, everything we did was on paper. It was books that we were reading. All the work I did as a as a student was written down in in a, in a book using a pen or pencil. Uh, the teachers would be writing on a blackboard with with chalk. And I'm sure some of those still exist today, but now, as you can see on the slide, there is uh, so much more available, uh, maybe smart boards, uh, a variety of apps that you're using either in the classroom or, or at home. Um, so you're using uh, different methods of communication. You're, there's much more variety in terms of ability to be creative. Access to information is very much easier uh, and Importantly, from an environmental perspective, uh, you're using a lot less paper than 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 we did back uh, back when we were students. Uh, and as I said earlier, the you know the biggest change is the ability to study from home. Um, and you know there are times when uh, schools have been closed, for example, due to the the COVID nineteen pandemic, and there are other opportunities to study at home uh, rather than necessarily be in a classroom. Um, five days a week. So now let's look at other workplaces and how technology has changed them. If we could go to the next slide, Tom. So again, why you know why do people work where they do? I mean, sometimes you need to work where things happen. So, for example, if you work for an airline, you need to work at an airport because that's where the planes land and take off to take people around the world. Um, if you're a firefighter, you need to be able to get to fires. You, you, you need to be where things happen that, that's part of your job. You also might need to be with customers. And so if you work in a shop, um, obviously you need to be in the shop, um, you know, where your customers will be coming in to, to look at and hopefully buy um, your, your goods or services. Um, and you're probably immediately thinking about the changes that have happened in shopping, you know, with the ability to buy online and get uh, items delivered to your house directly. You might also need to be in a workplace really just to be with other people. And so that's really what offices are. You know, offices are locations where people that you work with in teams or as colleagues, where you get together and collaborate, uh, talk to each other uh, and, 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 you know, work as, as a team. And I think you can probably immediately think about all of these different workplaces and how technology has changed, has changed them. And we'll, we'll now look on the next slide uh, at another workplace, which is, the hospital uh, and again just think about the impact that technology has had here um, there it, the picture on the left hand side there in black and white uh, is is a, uh, a picture I don't know exactly when this is from but uh, quite a few years ago uh, of uh, uh, a gentleman lying in bed uh, as a patient um, and as you can see there is really no technology around him at all there's there's nothing next to his bed the bed looks quite small and uncomfortable probably isn't really very adjustable uh, at least it does look like he has a lamp so he has some light uh, maybe at night to, to read or, or keep himself uh, occupied and then you compare that with the equipment and the comfort level you see in modern hospitals uh, so the picture on the right hand side there you can see some equipment there uh, probably monitoring uh, the patient's heart 
feet. Uh, you can see other plugs in the wall where you can plug in other equipment to either you know use equipment to understand what's happening to the patient, why they're ill, uh, and also um, equipment to actually treat them and 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 help them recover. Um, and and remember that change is constant. You know these are two snapshots in time. Uh, I'm sure if in 40 years time, 50 years time, we did this presentation again and added another picture of a hospital uh, in the future. Again, it, it would look, I'm sure it will look very different. OK, so um, we've talked about hospital. Um, I mentioned offices earlier, so I'm going to talk more about offices here and particularly around my own kind of experience over over my career. So I started work in 1988. Um, I'm still working today um, and I've seen a lot of change. Uh, so the picture on the left is an office you probably would have seen in the 70s or 1980s. Um, it's not actually my office from then, but it looks very similar to an office that, that my manager probably had at the time. Uh, and again, you can just see the lack of technology. Um, there's just a couple of pens on the desk. Um, there is a telephone which we'll come back to, um, but uh, again, it was you know no computers, no devices, uh, and lots of paper. Um, this desk is actually very tidy, um, but uh, many desks would be covered in paper with people um, writing memos or letters which then needed to be physically posted um, to another location. Very different to today, so this is my actual desk uh, that, that I'm sitting at at the moment uh, and you can see my computer there. You can see the extra screen I've got. You can see the headphones uh, on the desk there but, and these are these headphones that I'm wearing at the moment uh, to talk to you. Uh, and although you can't see it, my, my mobile phone is just off screen, uh, which I can also use to connect to uh, my, my work uh, uh, colleagues. And so really online communication has allowed people like myself to work, uh, still work with my colleagues and talk to them and write to them, interact with them very quickly, but do it remotely uh, from, from my home. Um, I mentioned the telephone, which you can see in that picture on the left. So one of the kind of old wired telephones. Um, I think it's interesting just for a bit of fun, really, to look at the history of the telephone. So on the next slide, um, we have a variety of different uh, telephones, some of which you may be more familiar with and some you may not have seen before. Um, the telephone was actually invented back in the late uh, 19th century, so well, the second half of the 19th century. And you can see in the top right corner there a phone from 18 from the 1870s. Uh, and I think this was actually a, a phone that was created by the inventor of the telephone, which was a scientist, a Scottish scientist called Alexander Graham Bell. Um, but you can then see how the telephone developed over the years. Um, that red telephone you can see there uh, from the 1970s, that's very similar to the first telephone I remember um, being installed in, in, in the house, uh, my parents' house. Um, uh, I, I remember being in the house when we had no phone and we had to walk down uh, to the public telephone to phone my grandparents. Uh, and then on the right hand side at the top there, you can see a typical office phone uh, that you uh, may even see today in some offices. Um, but then in the bottom uh, part of the slide, you can see the development of the mobile phone. And I think that phone in the top, uh, sorry, the bottom left corner in, from the 1980s, one of the first mobile phones is, is quite fun to look at. So imagine carrying that around. Uh, you certainly wouldn't be able to put that in your in your back pocket. Um, but then there was a very quick development. You can see over a period of 40 years, we've moved uh, into the, um, the mobile phones that we know today. Uh, which are much more than just phones. Um, the first iPhone there in 2007 and then uh, a Samsung uh, phone that you're probably very familiar with um, today. And so you can just see how how the phone has developed over time and, and how how more, you know, the speed of change is increasing. Um, 
you can just you know see from that last 20 years how much how much has changed so let's leave the phone now and um, we'll um, come on to the office I talked earlier about how um, uh, we now have the ability to work from home and the way that technology has changed the the office space um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of actually going to an office, being with other people, with colleagues, or working from home. And I've listed some of those here, and you could probably think of others. You know, but going into an office, you actually meet people physically. Um, and I think that's still important for many people. It gives you the ability to socialize outside of the workplace. So maybe having lunch with your colleagues, uh, or maybe going out after work. Um, it's also getting out of the house, uh, otherwise you, you maybe feel you're at home for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And some people would still argue that being face to face is more effective, gives you more effective communication than being uh, remote. Uh, actually being able to see someone and um, their body language, so the way their facial expression, the way they they change their hand position or things like that can actually portray quite a lot of information about how they're feeling, how they're thinking about things. Uh, and that may be lost when you're just communicating and maybe can only hear them, hear their voice or, or maybe just as you can with me, just maybe, you know, see my head and shoulders. There are also advantages to working from home. Um, you don't need to travel to the office, so maybe that means you have more time available uh, to to be more productive. Um, there are no costs involved in traveling. You don't need to charge your car or put petrol in your car or pay for public transport, um, for example. It may be more comfortable. Uh, it's your office. You can set the temperature how you want uh, rather than maybe be in a shared office where you need to compromise um, with with your colleagues. And of course, it gives you more flexibility. Uh, it allows you to uh, build into your day some of those kind of personal activities that that uh, um, are difficult when you're in an office, you know, so being there when when a, there's a delivery, uh, for example, would be a very uh, simple example. So now that I've given you those kind of advantages of, of uh, being in the office and being at home, we'll go to the next uh, interactive uh, session where we're, I'd like to ask you the question, you know, having heard all that, do you think you'd prefer to travel to a workplace, an office, or would you prefer to work from home if you had the choice? Um, and there are three options here, um, either you know, you'd like to work from home completely, you'd like to go to an office or a, a workplace, or you'd like to mix your days, so maybe some days in the office and some days at home. So I'll leave you a few minutes to um, to think about that question, and if you could if you could vote, um, we can see what your preferences would be. Okay, so we've got a very early vote for kind of mixed workplace. Someone there would prefer to work at home. So we'll just wait for a few more votes to come in. And just to say while you're voting, of course, there are some jobs where you have no choice. Um, if you're a firefighter, you have to go fight, fight fires. If you work in a hospital, you have to go to a hospital. But uh, where you do have the choice, um, then it's interesting to see what the thoughts are. OK, so it's about it's 50 50 at the moment between home and some days in the office and some at home. So the idea of being fully in an office is not very appealing to anyone at the moment. Maybe just wait a few more seconds. OK, so it's 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 about uh, it's a, a, almost an equal split between those who would like to work from home uh, and that's just pulled ahead a little bit uh, and those that would like to uh, spend some days in the office and, and some days at home. So thank you for your 
uh, for your votes. Um, and just to finish off, uh, we'll, we'll close that now and uh, we'll just go to the last slide. And so this is ju uh, just an idea for uh, an activity um, that your uh, teachers might want to um, uh, do with you as a, as a follow up. Um, we've talked about the workplace today and in the past. Uh, I'd like you to think and just imagine, you know, what your future place of work might look like um, and, and maybe draw a picture uh, of that. So I'll leave that as an idea for for a follow up uh, activity. So I hope you uh, found that interesting. Um, thank you for for listening. It's been great to have the time to present to you all. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thank you, Tom, as well. Both of you gave such informative and interesting talks, and I can see that we have some uh, great questions in the chat. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague James to put those to you. Thank you, Lisa. So um, now is the time where we've got um, to ask any questions you'd like um, to Andrew and Tom. Um, so please use the Q&A chat function and we'll try and get through as many as we can um, as time allows. Um, so first question we have got is what inspired you to become involved in science? Um, I can take this one. So for me, I've always found it interesting how we come up with all these new ideas and we come up with these new things like video games or new TV shows or new science projects that you get shown in school and those kinds of activities. And so uh, I actively pursued that because I was just very curious about the world and how we did all of these things. And as you go through studying science through school, middle, secondary, potentially the university, if that's what you'd like to do, you get to test out and try a lot more experiments and you get a better understanding of the how the world works and I just found that fascinating personally and I still do and it's why I love working on the clinical studies at IQBA because I get to see all the new medicines that are going to be hopefully given to the wider public in the next few years. Yeah and I can answer that as well from, from, for, for myself. Um, Basically, when I was at secondary school, I found I was uh, more excited and interesting in, in the scientific subjects. I actually had quite a broad interest in uh, mathematics uh, and all the sciences, really, um, biology, chemistry, physics, um, but particularly biology. And I, I was fascinated particularly by microbiology. So the idea of these viruses and bacteria that you couldn't see with the naked eye having uh, such a um, big impact on on people's uh, health uh, and um, and also animal health and and all the other weird and wonderful things that microbes do in in the natural world uh, and so um, I did eventually go uh, to study uh, the biological sciences uh, and that's uh, how I, I ended up in in clinical research uh, and and you know working on new medicines uh, to to improve the the health and lives of 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 patients uh, so that's that's really um, you know has really been motivating throughout my career thank you both and um, the next question is from St Margaret and they've asked how long did it take to make a medicine so it it can vary a little depending on what type of medicine you want to make and what it's looking for, look, looking at solving specifically. But typically, I would say anywhere between three to five years from discovery of new medicine to putting it through the different stages of clinical trials to then it being allowed to be given to the wider public. And the reason that is, is because with any new study, with any new medicine, you need to put it through four different phases of clinical research where you add more and more people to make sure it's safe and it does what we expect it to do. And that's why it, I would say a minimum of three years and anywhere up from that, depending on what specific is, specifically it's trying to solve. Thank you. And um, the next question we've got, um, also from St Margaret's, asking when using a plant for medicine, how do they turn it into a liquid? So early in the early uh, days of it, they did just kind of blend it until it was a liquid. 
uh, they just kept putting uh, uh, more water or other liquids that would help dissolve the material. And then they could use other chemical processes to extract the specific thing that they needed from the plant. Nowadays, they can they do that a bit more sophisticated. Um, they can, with, a, with different machines that break apart the plants in a more surgical manner to get what they want quicker. But ultimately, it comes down to make it, dissolving it into a liquid for whatever mechanism they can, and then extracting it through more uh, take, uh, through other machines to get it. Thank you so much. Um, the next question we've got is asking: Do you prefer working at home, um, or do you prefer to work in your office, or both? <laughs> um, so personally. Um, I prefer working in an office, even though I'm at home now. Uh, I think I think a lot of it is what you're used to. So I worked in an office full time for um, the first 30 years of my career. So that's what I'm used to. I like the idea of meeting people and working together. Um, I've worked from home now for about yeah five or six years. Um, and although I do get the opportunity to um, travel sometimes to meet colleagues, um, and of course it has advantages being at home, uh, it, I f personally feel it can be a bit uh, isolating. Um, so my my personal preference is is working, you know, in an office with others. Um, but um, yeah, it you know the, there are different needs of different jobs. Um, so some jobs you need to be more together, some jobs being remote is fine and there's a personal preference uh, aspect to it uh, as, as well. Um, but yeah, I'm used to working in office, so I guess that's what that's what I prefer. Yeah, um, I'll jump in as well, my preference. I personally, I'm the opposite. I quite, li uh, quite like working at home. I've only been working for about eight or nine years now. And I both I started off working in the office and then for the last few years I've been working at home and I personally I've always uh, disliked the commute to work uh, and I've also enjoyed sleeping longer as my personal <laughs> preferences and it also means that the local cafes or points of interest in the city that I would never I would normally never get to go to just because I'm too busy I get to experience that a bit more so I can take breaks to go for night before walks around the city or get a nice cup of coffee or a nice lunch but again, I, I, I've seen both sides of it and I, I fully agree with some of the points that Andrew was making about working in the office as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. The next question we've got um, is saying about what new technology would you like to use for your work at home? Oh, that's, well, uh, well, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, feel free to go first, Andrew. No, I, the only thing, well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is I think as technology advances, the kind of quality of the the video connection. So get more of a kind of 3D kind of environment where you actually feel that you're with other people. I think that's going to maybe they're already, but uh, I, I think anything that uh, um, ma makes the, the, the connection with others more real. I think would be would be great. Very, yeah, that's a very good answer. I think for me, I would love a bit more integration with uh, AI in the sense that I like to talk verbally what my problems are so I can think about the so it just helps me solve them at a better angle. And I feel if I had uh, AI that could bounce, I could bounce up ideas. It would help me just like organize how I want to do my work and how I can make this clinical study better. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I think. No, thank you both. It's, yeah, that was a, quite a tough question and something um, to be what we want in addition to what we have right now. Um, the next question we've got is actually, what's your favorite part of your job? I can go first. Um, so I've been in a management position for many years now, and I really enjoy um, coaching and helping others develop their careers. Uh, so, um, you know, part of my job is to support my team and, and uh, you know, ensure they have the training they need and the support they need to um, be most effective in their job. 
um, but I, I particularly like, you know, running coaching sessions, having conversations with um, with my team members about uh ideas they are having and um questions they have about their own career development um so i i really enjoy that aspect of my job i think for me the one of the most rewarding and uh, aspects of my job is that at the end of clinical studies typically you will have to take away the medicine you've been given the patients up until that point because the study is closing and they would need to take the locally available medicines. But there's, a, there's, a regular, there's new laws that allow us to, if a patient is responding well, that they are allowed to continue using this medicine that we've been testing because we found it safe for them and it's providing really good benefits. And I really do fight for every patient that is uh, responding well to these medicines to get that early access. And I, I find that one of the more rewarding aspects of my job. Thank you both. Um, still going back to your job, however, in a different way, if you didn't do this job today, what would you do? What would you have done? Uh, this is this might be a little left field, but I think I would be a baker. Uh, that's, I, I'm a bit of a hobbyist myself. Um, for, uh, and I, I made a cheesecake yesterday um, for a friend's dinner anyway. But I quite like the process of it because it is a little scientific. You get to try different pastries or doughs, uh, different cakes, and you get to really refine what you're doing. And you also get to eat it afterwards. Um, when I was younger, I, I did consider uh, training to become a doctor. Um, so it's kind of related to what I do, but uh, but but actually being, um, you know, a medical professional working working with patients, um, and then maybe the other thing, um, I I, in hindsight, I would have loved to have been would be an airline pilot. Uh, I I love flying, um, and uh, I've, as a as a as a um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for um as a passenger but um yeah i think the idea of being a pilot um would be appealing but i'm too old now <laughs> never too old these days <laughs> um the next question we've got is um is from Nominus, um is what's the most interesting thing you know wow Wow, yeah. <laughs> Most interesting thing I know. We can come back to that in a sec. Yeah, can, so I, can just... I think about that? That's a very good yes. question, though. <laughs> um, the next one we got is, um, what should I study to work with medicines? Um, I would say if you want to work with medicines, the biggest two would be biology and chemistry. And you would need to have the, you would also need to study maths. I know those are very boring topics to some people, but they really uh, provide the core skill set you need to understand how medicine works and how it interacts with, with the with people. Uh, maths lets you work out the specific percentages you need to give people because too many medicine, too much of a medicine can be harmful to people. So you need to be very precise in that. And the chemistry helps you work out how to, for instance, it, how you're going to extract the medicine from a plant or from uh, or learn how it affects people's bodies and similar to biology as well. Um, I would say those are the three core. Yeah, and to add to that, I think it's always uh, worth remembering that, um, you know, there are many aspects to um, medicine development. Um, so, yeah, there's those kind of core um, um, topics like like biology and chemistry um, for some roles. So, for example, uh, developing new medicines um, in that development process, there's a lot of statistics involved uh, in terms of uh, working out, uh, you know, whether the the new medicine is is more is more effective than than a previous or an older one. And there's a lot of statistics involved in in making those calculations. So. Um, 
the mathematics and statistics can can be important. Um, there's also, um, you know, in the clinical research process, there's people who have to be involved in logistics. So, you know, shipping, uh, shipping uh, medicines, uh, shipping equipment from, you know, one one location to the hospitals or GP centres where the trial is being run. So, there's there's those kind of, um, um, you know, uh, those those jobs as well. So, a really wide variety of um, of um, careers can, um, you know, take you in that that direction of working on uh, on medicine development. Thank you. Um, the next question we've got is for our STJ. So thanks for joining us. Um, is asking what is the best thing about medicine? I think the best thing about medicine personally is just seeing how much it revitalizes people and it makes them come back alive because sometimes when you get ill it really takes it out of you but you become very tired all of a sudden you become very angry that you what you're not at your normal state and i i think the best thing about medicine is that it can stop all of that it can give you a new breath of life in a sense and it really changes people like people's lives I, I have an idea for the question about what's the most interesting thing I know. Oh, tell us. <laughs> and and this is only because it was something I read the uh, the other day and I'd never thought about before. And it's actually about uh, time is obviously the, the topic of this uh, British Science Week and, and it relates to time and and um, it, it and it's around dinosaurs. Um, so you've probably heard of two quite famous dinosaurs as the Stegosaurus uh, and the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, Stegosaurus uh, was alive during what was called the Jurassic period uh, and it was around 150 million years ago. Um, the Tyrannosaurus Rex was a uh, lived in a later um, time period called the Cretaceous uh, which was around 65 million years ago and so if you work out the time difference the Tyrannosaurus Rex actually lived closer in history to us today than it did the Stegosaurus. That's, I like that, that's a very good fact. And there's another one around the uh, the um, uh, the pyramids in, in Egypt, which I can talk about if we have time, but I'll, <laughs> I'll think, stop there. I think my one is uh, related to time as well, but as you know, Humans have been on this planet for thousands of years now, and we spread across to every corner of the world. And what's interesting is when we go to these new regions, we adapt specifically for the climate we're in and the environment. And now there are people who have learned, who have adapted to just not sweat. They don't get sweat from they don't sweat from exercise. There are people who have bigger lungs now, so they can dive deeper into the ocean. And there are people um, who have uh, better red blood cells in their body, so they can act they're actually more naturally athletic than people. And I find that fascinating because we're all the same species, but there's just so much variation between us that we keep discovering these new adaptions. And those people are with their like when they find their stuff out, they help really expand our scientific knowledge. Thank you both for doing insights. Um, a couple more questions we got um, and actually it's using time as a theme actually but looking at the future um, so the first question we've got is what is the future of medicine so this is actually something i've worked a little a lot on currently with an iqv but the what i think one of the big futures of medicine is it being more much more personalized to the person rather than a generic treatment plan. So typically at the moment we have we know the disease and we know how it interacts with the average person. And so we give them a medicine that we know would have a generic effect on a specific disease or infection. But now we're moving to an age where you could come into a GP or hospital, they might take a bit of your blood and then they'll be able to personally tailor and create a unique treatment plan that would work on you the be in the best possible manner. And I find that fascinating because it means we'll be able to work that much faster and solve 
people's illnesses that much better because it's so personalized. Thank you very much. And the last question we've got is, or two more, sorry. So first one is asking, um, how will AI um, work in the future for yourselves? So I I can um, answer that one for, for, for myself. So um, I think as Tom mentioned, um, you know, AI tools are now really just being um, of becoming available in the workplace. So, for example, at IQVIA, uh, we have two or three, three different, um, in fact, more than that, different uh, um, AI uh, tools, particularly around what's called generative AI, which is where AI is being used to create information or pull together information in a useful way. Um, so, for example, in clinical research, uh, we have to work often to what we call SOPs, which are standard operating procedures. So we have to do things in a very structured way um, to make sure that we're um, following the right procedure and there's, there's not much variety, you know, too much variety in, in the way that we do things. And, and that makes it just a much more controlled process. Uh, and we have hundreds of these documents of, of procedures that we need to reference. We now have a, a test AI tool which would allow us to ask a question um, and it would actually search through all of those SOPs and actually give us a summary of all the references in our procedures to that particular piece of uh, information uh, and, and that is really so useful uh, to um, you know just speed up your ability to make sure that you are uh, following the, the, the right um, process so that, that that's one example. Thank you so much. And the last one we've been asked, um, which person, place or thing inspires you to most succeed? I think for me, I, I may not look it, but I'm actually uh, half Costa Rican. And uh, when I grew up there, when I was younger, I was really taken away just by how much uh, how much nature there was there the rainforest the tortoises in the bay the or the incredible array of birds and that really inspired me initially for my love of science because i realized that we there's so much there's so much variety and there's so much out there and all of colors and the things left to find deep in the jungles that is what inspires me and it still does every time i go back i see it and i'm always taken back Yeah, I mean, my answer is actually fairly similar. I, I certainly nature and the world around us inspires me. Um, I, I've been very lucky to live in and work in in different countries. I've I've worked in Australia, I've worked in China, I've worked in the US, uh, as well as here in the UK, and to see you know different cultures around the world, to see the different ways in which people think and the different environments people live in, the different just the, the different way. Uh, people operate um, and, and, the, and the nature and, and technology in those different locations uh, as, as uh, I've always been inspired by. Thank you both for joining us today and I'll just hand over to Lisa um, to do the final bits. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And um, thank you to Tom and Andrew. Um, it really is inspiring listening to you two. So thank you for giving up your time. And I'm sure the audience has been inspired by what they've learned today, even the bit about the old phones as well, um, which were made long before they were born. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of um, British Science Week. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.